Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's first session of the M Schools That Change series. In this session called Changing Education Together, we will look at how our education systems are being impacted by technological changes, globalization, and the health crisis, and what needs to be done to respond to the demands of a rapidly changing world. In this context, schools and educators have a key role to play in preparing students to be active and responsible citizens in a connected digital society while teaching skills will be essential in the constantly evolving professions and careers, and also providing opportunities for the most vulnerable. We will try to look at what policies could be put in place and what actions should be taken to harness the power of technology and connectivity to achieve the goals of quality and ed equitable education, while also protecting the rights and well-being of learners. And I'm very happy to say that we have some great people with us today, representing three very influential institutions with what I would say is a main shared objective that of empowering and improving the lives of people around the globe. Let me present these panelists and dear colleagues. First of all, I'll start with uh, Cristobal Cobo. Cristobal is a senior education and technology specialist at the World Bank. And I can tell you that uh, he served as a founding director for the Center of Research at Seibal Foundation in Uruguay, his uh, native homeland. And he works at the intersection between the future of learning, of cultural innovation and human-centered technologies. And he will certainly explain what these things mean to us a little bit today. Um, he's also served as a validator for the Intermarital Development Bank, the National Science Foundation at MIT, uh, International Labor Organization, et cetera, et cetera. And recently, he published a number of books, but the most recent is titled, I Accept the Terms and Conditions, the Uses and Abuses of Digital Technologies, which is available in English and some other languages, and uh, which we very recently had the opportunity to discuss with him at some other events, and we were just rem reminiscing how interesting it, it was, but how things have also changed since then. And, and maybe we can discuss some of those today as well. Um, our next speaker is Juan Pablo Giraldo. He's an expert at innovation education at UNICEF. Uh, Juan Pablo's work includes uh, innovation in education programs, emphasizing learning outcomes, evidence generation, and partnership negotiation, supportive education work in more than 190 countries and territories. Very impressive stuff. Um, I have to say that um, he's always looking for ways to harness technology for large scale social impact. He has participated in the design and implementation of programs that directly improved the lives and conditions for 60,000 people and enabled more efficient spending of over $4 billion per year. That's much more than I have ever uh, spent. And uh, we'd be very interested to hear also what he's been doing. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have with us also Sobi Tawil, who's a director of the Future Learning and Innovation section at UNESCO. Um, Sobi has over 30 years of experience in teaching, education, policy analysis, research, and program management with diverse institutions and organizations, not only UNESCO. So he currently leads the Futures of Education Initiative, which is a very interesting initiative that he will certainly discuss today and we'll, we'll, we'll bring into focus. Um, and it aims to rethink education and shape the future by catalyzing a global debate on how, to, on how knowledge, education, and learning need to be reimagined in a world of increasing complexity and certainly in precarity. So certainly very much within the theme of this panel today, uh, because that's exactly what we want to try and cover. Now, perhaps I sort of started um, uh, alphabetically. I can just go sort of go backwards and start with, with Sobi initially. And Sobi, maybe um, I would sort of ask you the first question, which is, you know, what work have you been doing recently? How has this Futures of Education in initiative evolved? I know that there's some publications coming up in the next few months. I know that you're doing a lot of work in this area. Um, how do you see all the impact of the pandemic? You know, what has been this this sort of effort of yours in the past few months and years or year and a half um, to address these changes in education? The floor is yours, Sobi. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Albert, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here also and uh, see some uh, colleagues as well on, on the panel. Um, just to uh, maybe give a, a, a quick sense of uh, the work that's being done in the, the team I'm leading, uh, there is work around technology and education, uh, clearly. Uh, some of that is country support in, in terms of uh, policy planning, management of you know, um, uh, technology and education uh, interventions. Uh, some of it is more at the, in terms of knowledge sharing, and uh, some of you may be familiar with the Mobile Learning Week as an annual event of uh, bringing together all those who are um, interested, engaged, and 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 uh, active in 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 the area of uh, technology and education. There's also some normative work which goes beyond the work of our team, but I think uh, in line with UNESCO mandate um, on uh, recommendation that is in preparation on ethics of inter of uh, artificial intelligence. 
there's a recommendation around uh, open educational resources. And there's work, uh, Albert, that you're familiar with now in terms of developing a declaration on connectivity for education. So this is the work around technology. The other piece is, is what you mentioned, uh, Albert, uh, the Futures of Education initi Initiative, which was uh, initiated uh, end of 2019, um, so pre-COVID. Um, COVID and the educational disruption, I, in a sense, brought the future you know, to the present, if you wish. Um, but we still have that tension, um, being an intergovernmental organization and you know, accounting for the diversity of contexts around the world. Of, we, we have a foot in the past, unfulfilled promises in terms of you know, universal education, quality, meaningful education, and we have a foot in the future. I mean, so the Futures of Education Initiative is really how do we, how do we bridge the, the past, present, and future? Um, and, and clearly with um, some of the you know, disruptions and transformations that you quickly mentioned, uh, which I think are, are, are key now in terms of not only adapting to the future, but how do we try to shape the future? Uh, so it's not only about probable uh, futures, but also what possible alternatives and, and what a new approach to, to education might look like uh, to help uh, shape those futures. Over to you, uh, Albert, and I could come back in on this later. Sure. Thank you, Sobi. It's very interesting. And yes, we will we will come back to this because there's still a, a lot to talk about, a lot of meat on the hook, as we could say. Um, I don't want to um, uh, delay too much getting to Juan Pablo because I know he's also unfortunately in the middle of a tropical storm, I believe. Um, so we're hoping that he won't be disconnected at any point, but uh, obviously that's globalization. Everybody is somewhere different and, and that makes it difficult. Um, but Juan Pablo, um, you know, I know that also from the UNICEF perspective, you guys have done a lot of work um, in different areas that, 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 that sometimes overlap with the UNESCO side, but uh, certainly are very much in conjunction with what is being done. Um, I know that you've also published some papers around um, actions that sh should be taken uh, to, to improve education across the globe. And you've done a lot of activity in, in trying to figure out um, how to reach the most vulnerable and some of the most needy students and learners that we have uh, in many di different denominations. So maybe you can sort of give us a little bit of update as well on, on, on what you see happening from your perspective. Um, what are the recent activities that have been, you know, due to the pandemic and to many other needs have arisen? Um, and what is the work you're focused on that you think is, is relevant in this, in, this, in this space? Over to you, Juan Pablo. Thank you, Albert, and, and uh, glad to be here with Xavi and Cristobal. Um, uh, and thank you for, for, the, for the call out to the, to the tropical storm, Elsa. I hope uh, I'm, I'm around 160 kilometers south of where it's really bad right now. I think it's, it's OK. Um, as you said, uh, uh, Albert, UNICEF has worked uh, uh, globally during the pandemic to respond to the pandemic. And we recently published our annual results report. Uh, we uh, were able to report that around 300 million children were supported with remote and distant, distance learning opportunities during COVID-19. Uh, I think as, as, as Sobi was mentioning, we have a unfinished work that predated the pandemic and the pandemic exacerbated uh, an already ongoing learning crisis. Uh, children and young people that did not have the opportunity to develop the skills that they need for the present and the future, to be citizens, to be workers, and to be able to learn more and, and follow their, their interests, their motivations, and to realize their unlimited potential. Um, we believe in UNICEF that um, this pandemic has shown also a glimpse of what's possible. And we think uh, that we have a once in a generation opportunity to transform what we have now into excellent high performing education systems. The vision for that uh, and technology is gonna be strategic. The use of technology is gonna be strategic uh, in this vision is that we want education that can follow each individual's needs, 
that does not isolate the individual, that allows the individual to work with others, to collaborate with others, that has uh, multiple uh, learning pathways in classroom. If you have dropped out of a school, easier way, uh, uh, an easy way in remedial and catch up programs uh, to develop the full range of skills uh, from foundational. And uh, I don't know if Cristobal is gonna touch on the excellent work the world, the world Bank has done on learning poverty, but we know that in foundational literacy and also in numeracy, we have an unfinished work, uh, but also in skills such as collaboration, creativity, uh, critical thinking, uh, and civic engagement. Um, and this vision uh, can um, uh, only be realized if we agree of course, with, uh, with each country and each municipality and each school, and at the end of the day, each classroom, uh, that uh, we have to have a common vision, a common vision that uh, uh, has the skills uh, and the student at the center and the teacher as a facilitator, as a designer of learning experiences for the students. And in this technology can, can be uh, very useful because uh, if, if it's used strategically, uh, the teacher uh, can uh, direct the students uh, to uh, uh, their own personal inquiry, to be exposed to new information, to have the ability to present back to the group uh, what they have learned. And, um, and perhaps also importantly to uh, in many places of the world, this is the student teacher ratio is really bad to uh, have face to face interaction between the teacher and the student uh, being very strategic, very targeted to what the student needs. Uh, and and that, that vision, those enablers in UNICEF, we call them reimagine education and connectivity, world class digital learning solutions, access to devices, uh, data affordability and engagement with young people are the five key pillars of that vision. Of course, and I think we're gonna get that, uh, uh, into that with more detail later, Albert and colleagues, but uh, the great bottleneck here uh, are the equity gaps. The, the, those who are on the wrong side of the digital divide, those who, even though they may have access to uh, devices, do not have access to connectivity, those that with all of that do not have the support. And those, uh, when I say those, I include teachers, students, and, and parents. So over to you, Albert, and I hope we can get into more detail uh, as we go along. Over. Thank you, Juan Pablo, absolutely. Um... Those are very interesting topics that we will touch upon. You know, in particular, as we were saying, equitable education, um, reaching the most needy, um, and I think also this is something that people tend to um, uh, maybe lose focus on a little bit because you know some of us in the more developed countries or higher income countries uh, tend to see the ed education systems we have as um, not requiring specific support for some of those populations. Um, but it's very much the contrary. Within our own boundaries, we have uh, many people who are uh, vulnerable, who need connectivity, who do not have access to it, who do not have access to the right set of skills. And therefore, all, these, all this work that is being done from the side of UNICEF is very applicable, I think, to, to many other uh, regions as well than maybe some of, the, some of the ones that you originally target because they're so vulnerable. Um, so some of those lessons, I think we can very much apply to what we do in our regions as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit, I hope. Okay, thank you. So um, next on the list is uh, Cristobal Cobo. As I said, Cristobal is, um, um, he's very well known, I think, to the local public here in, in, in Catalonia because um, he's, uh, he's uh, been here for some time and had some activity here. Um, but he's also worked in a number of many different projects across the globe and now within the World Bank, I think also has um, a, a very unique vision on um, some of the changes in, in the activities that are happening. And certainly, um, I think that maybe he will tell us a little bit more about it, but we'll be very interested to hear um, how he sees, you know, all the aspects of the pandemic, what has happened, and, and, and since he wrote his book, what has changed and what things uh, need to be upgraded so that we can come out maybe sometime with a new edition, right, Cristobal? Anyways, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Albert. Merci. 
Uh, yes, actually, I did my PhD in Barcelona, so it's my second home. I think I have uh, Catalan blood, at least in my heart. So let me see if I can share some ideas that trying to connect what my colleagues have mentioned. As Juan Pablo rightly said, I think this is a picture right when the pandemic was starting on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is the current reality where some systems are already open or partially open. But I think if we look on the left-hand side, um, when the pandemic started, we were not in the ideal world. Um, Juan Pablo has rightly mentioned the idea of the learning poverty, which is basically suggesting that um, over half, 50 percent of the students who are 10 years old cannot read and understand a simple text. So that was a reality before the pandemic, and we really fear that that number will increase massively uh, because of them because of the limited access to, to education. Uh, we know that over 1.6 billion students' life has been disrupted in terms of having access to, to education. Now, the, the ed tech sector has been in the, in the spotlight. And there's a massive, massive level, level of attention to the, to the investment on, on technology. High expectations countries are rushing to incorporate technology. And I think this can be interesting. And some of the projections say that it would, the, the, in the period 2019 to 2025, uh, that will, will increase up to 2.5 times the investment in the past, which is a huge amount. But at the same time, obviously, the expectations about the role that technology will play has been changing. And I think, I think it's important to say that uh, the preliminary results that we have, even in, in affluent countries like the Netherlands, where the access to connectivity and infrastructure is not limited, is, uh, they have a, an ideal environment compared with other regions, they have seen that the learning loss is in the neighborhood of 20%. Uh, and that number really increased up to 40% in other regions. So the picture that is, uh, the emerging picture that is still in the process of being more sharp is really, really worrying. So we know technology can be helpful, but it's not enough to make the changes that we need. So here, I would like to say that um, a lot of the enthusiasm about technology usually uh, do not put enough attention to these other two arrows, which I think are essential. One is the enabling conditions. One is obviously, as we will discuss today, the skills, uh, digital skills of teachers, students, policymakers as well, and also the infrastructure required. Um, and I get back into, into that in a minute. But this is not enough. If we have the enabling conditions and we don't address the supportive environment that will happen right after we have technology, the change won't happen. So that means to have the proper training, to have the regular follow-up, to have remedial help, to have some level of tutoring, to have additional actions that will secure the technology will be integrated. So if, if you allow me, I would say that we have seen a lot of disruption in the transformation and the speed of change of the technology, but the social practices, how we incorporate that is completely in a different speed. And I don't want to even mention the capacity of the organizations to change to those practices. And I don't want to even address how left behind are the regulatory framework that allow to play in this game. So we have all these imbalances in terms of speed. As Clay Shirky used to say, the revolution doesn't happen with a society adopt a new tool. It really happened with the society adopt a new behavior. And this pandemic has been really pushing the idea of changing the behavior. And it's so painful to change behavior because it requires much more than turning on the screen. So that will require not only having access to infrastructure, but also changing much more structural uh, dimensions, as my colleagues have mentioned. Um, rethink the school, rethink the idea how we learn, decentralize the knowledge, enable more collaboration, uh, promoting the idea of uh, more higher levels of agency. And these elements will go far beyond the idea of having the enabling conditions. And I think this is a concern that we have. How can we facilitate innovations that are not limited to the infrastructure? So for instance, on the skills component, uh, before the pandemic, we, we know that uh, based on studies from the ICUs, this global international study, um, less than half of the teachers were incorporating technology regularly less than half. So uh, now in the context of the pandemic, we might say, well, maybe this number has changed. The question is how that change has happened. Um, and I, I think it's important to say that digital skills, they tend to be addressed as, an, as a standalone capacity when they cannot be or should not be understood as an, in isolation because digital skills will be highly connected with numeracy, literacy, critical thinking, and other capacities. So if you allow me, I think the, the challenge we have here is to support teachers and in, a three, in at least three levels. One, 
is obviously having the instrumental capacities to use these tools. Number two, developing the pedagogical practices to make these transformations. We have to do with adjusting the time, the conversation, decentralizing the knowledge. And I think there is an even deeper one that has to do with the changing in the mindset. It's completely a different relationship with knowledge, uh, that the knowledge can be coming from different disciplines, that we can assess the knowledge in a different way. And that is, these are transformations that may be facilitated by the, the technological change, but will require other, other changes. So if we want to think how we can help the countries in this context, of course, we will have to address all these challenges around the left hand side. We have to address connectivity. We have to secure platforms that are relevant for the countries and the, in the appropriate language for the right context and promote um, high quality monitoring tools for taking decisions at the right time. But at the same time, if we really want to facilitate a much more democratic way of benefiting of these transformations, we have to address all these other components that might be more nuanced if you want. Um, disciplinary and multidisciplinary, one teaching or several people teaching at the same time. And all these changes, I think we are in the middle of a very hard time as we, as we saw the numbers are, are very um, devastating. But at the same time, I want to believe that this can be an opportunity of resetting some things that we didn't like, like in the past. So let me finish saying that at the World Bank, we think the integration of technology should have the, have the long picture, the big picture and the long, and the long vision. So one thing is, is critical to have, um, to be able to answer the question, ask why. It might sound very obvious, but it's not that, all that obvious. Why are you integrating technology? And what is the real purpose you have is gonna be essential. Number two, uh, and this pandemic has been a clear evidence of that, is we have to design solutions at a scale. Solutions that will be benefiting a small community or a boutique solution, it's not gonna work. If you want to be inclusive, we have to design solutions at a scale. Number three, Teachers. Teachers are essential, and these have been one of the most critical resources during the pandemic. Technology is not to bypass teachers, technology is to empower their capacity. Number four, engaging the ecosystem. Ministers of Education required to work with telecoms, with publishers, with others. That means Ministers of Education needs to be learning organizations. And finally, data driven. Having better data for taking better decisions, I think, is an essential component. And in this pandemic, I think. Uh, have shown that there's so much work to do in this area. So I'll get back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Cristobal. Very, very interesting um, and very relevant as well to what we were just talking about. Um, maybe what I can do is, given that you've already sort of touched on some of these topics, um, I would like to sort of start the conversation um, by maybe trying to look at what happened over the past few months and year and a half and, and just look at this whole pandemic and, and what it has, how it has affected us and what has happened. Um, I think a lot has been said already probably about it, but I think more than discuss about how many people have been, you know, left out and all that, which, you know, we obviously still being recounted and we still need to understand what the full impact has been. Um, I'd also like to think about, and maybe um, with your, your, the vision you guys have, because you are institutions that have sort of a global remit. Um, maybe you could share with us some of the best experiences you've seen, some of the best practices you've, you've experienced in different countries, institutions, or globally about how some of the response to the pandemic has been, uh, has been positive in, in, in some sense. Who would like to start with this? Anybody has um, some thoughts in this area? I, I do, uh, but... Uh... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I would just like to uh, perhaps uh, give a, a few examples that also show that, you know, all the gaps, uh, there's also an opportunity to act. One would be Timor-Leste. Uh, in Timor-Leste, we had a very poor infrastructure in terms of connectivity, low access to devices, uh, but the, 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 the Ministry of Education team there uh, partnered with UNICEF and other local partners and international partners to uh, create a platform that uh, enable a remote teacher training. So this idea that when you have an ecosystem where the students do not have access to the devices, but the teachers may have, then the teacher is the entry point for potentially a transformational change. And the teacher training, of course, was about remote teaching and remote learning strategies for uh, all the teachers. And one thing that I would like to say is that in, in Timor-Leste, 
thanks to the partnership with, for example, the private sector, Microsoft, uh, who provided a, a platform that could quickly scale, we were able to, in nine days, create uh, the, the instance, upload the content, and reach out to over 20,000 teachers in nine days. Uh, of course, uh, there we're talking about access, and we will need to know much more about the, the points that both Sobi and Cristobal were making about a behavior change, but the potential to start something so quickly and reach out to so many, basically all the teachers in Timor-Leste is something important. I would also like to talk about Jordan. In Jordan, again, there's a infrastructure gaps, uh, but we have a, a government that uh, decided to combine all technologies. And when I say te all technologies, I'm including paper. So delivering uh, paper-based packages, combining those packages with videos for parents to be able to support learning and teaching at home, uh, WhatsApp groups that emerge almost organically, and importantly, uh, a subset of materials that uh, was targeted to parents uh, of children with disabilities. So the, the videos that targeted those parents that were uploaded on YouTube and in other platforms were really targeted for the most, the, the, the ones that could suffer the most because of the lack of access to physical institutions. So how parents could engage with the materials that they had on paper with their, uh, with their children so that uh, the learning loss could be minimized. So uh, you see, combining all technologies and targeting children with disabilities, very, very important. And uh, I would also add Kosovo, the, the territory. I think Kosovo decided uh, uh, that system-wide, uh, they were going to have a more resilient infrastructure in terms of a learning management system. That, was going, that is going to be able to reach every single school and every single student in the, right now and in the, in the coming years. So if there's another disruption or shock, at least there would be some elements and some experience that would allow for a, a more resilient and a more responsive reaction. So, so those, two, those, those three examples, I think, show different different good practices for different contexts and needs. Thank you. Let, let me ask you sort of a follow-up question to that. Um, in, these, in these efforts you've seen across different countries, how important has it been involving the families um, with you know, the response to the pandemic? Because it, you know, in, it strikes me that, that we've had a lot of issues in that sense in, in having the families up to speed and being able to support the, uh, sorry, the learners. So how has that been? How have you seen that? Uh, that's been essential and it's been sort of a programmatic challenge in all of the responses I've, I've seen and I've read. Um, I, I'm, you know, from Pratham and, and other partners in India, reaching out to parents using SMS or, or calling parents uh, to, to visits, even at the height of the pandemic, we have teachers visiting uh, 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 homes and talking to the families through through the door frame, you know, you know. So uh, absolutely, absolutely essential. Uh, and I think as uh, and we can see it also in our personal experience, uh, it, it's been it's been a cycle. Uh, first, uh, uh, the engagement with with the students, uh, with the with the children, uh, with our sons and daughters, thinking it was going to be a few weeks or maybe a few months. Uh, and then getting into the inertia of realizing that this uh, is a new normal and it's still a new normal in many countries that have, that still have schools closed. So it's been essential, it's been challenging. And I think it also offers an opportunity in the coming years to reassess uh, and give more visibility of the value of the teaching profession. I think everyone now realizes firsthand how uh, strategic and important the, teacher, the teachers are in a society. And I think that's gonna allow us to, to, to move forward together. 
Thank you for that, Juan Pablo. Um, Sobi, I would sort of wanted to be, throw a bit of a follow up to you as well here. Um, you know, we, we've we've obviously seen many different responses to to what happened, and unfortunately, you know, looking back at Cristobal's sort of blueprint, um, you know, where the first thing he says is "ask why." Um, unfortunately, that wasn't really feasible, probably for many countries and 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 educational systems. Uh, it was really more than ask why, it was what can I do quickly, right? Um, but obviously that's a very specific scenario we're responding to a crisis. But um, in that sense that uh, a lot of countries have had to adapt um, to the situation on the ground, um, what, what responses have you seen that have been particularly useful in, in you know, from, more from a policy perspective, from a government perspective and how they've enacted some of these policies and some of these uh, uh, um, situations, how they've, how they've uh, faced the, the response? Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Albert. On, on, um, I think on, on Juan Pablo's um, uh, points, uh, I mean, one thing that became clear is, uh, you know, to caution against the over-reliance on, you know, connected technology, and we saw that what, what worked best, in particular when we are in a, you know, in a lens of ensuring uh you know more equitable access to to learning opportunities that we have a mix of of technologies but it's also true that um you know there's there's been there was initially a lot of optimism i, I would say those who were um looking uh to you know prior to covid who were looking to the transformation and the end you know, and you know this this final transformation of the factory model, and here was an imposed, you know, um, opportunity to innovate. Uh, that that optimistic discourse, I mean, did temper a little bit. And I think what you're saying is correct that, you know, beyond calls for you know accelerating the digitalization of education, the digital transformation of education, that there is a more fundamental question that Christopher is, is you know, one of the, the first point that was mentioned, the why. Um, the why and not to forget that technology is at the service of, I mean, when we come to issues of, you know, discussions around the right to connectivity, I mean, connectivity and universal connectivity might be a shared goal, but it is at the service of another purpose and aim uh, that we have in education. Um, and and uh, I think that's important to um, uh, you know to 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 keep in mind. Um, on the right to connectivity, I mean, what we've seen with the COVID pandemic, I mean, we have had we internationally, I mean, a shared global goal of universal education over decades and and we're moving towards that and we know some of the challenges what we mentioned is some of the you know the legacy of the past and we do have a shared goal of universal connectivity because of the digital transformation of our lives in all facets of our lives including education covid got those two parallel efforts to you know force them to to to, to connect but it's it's a connection where we cannot overlap and and say that um, you know the right to connectivity is in itself a goal. And in, in some of the discussions we've had, we've heard uh, you know around the futures of education, we we heard some provocations around the right to non-connectivity for education in education, and and you know some were were very shocked. But but behind that is to say we cannot make the right to education reliant on technology, given the scale of the digital divide, both technically and, and the human dimension of that divide um, in terms of you know, having the, uh, the inappropriate skills. By the way, one of the early surveys that was done last year among national education authorities in deployment of distance learning with the closure of schools, and, and this regardless of development status, mentioned the lack of adequate digital skills as being the main barrier among students, but even more so among teachers and even more so among uh, parents and care uh, caregivers. So I think the, 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 um, 
uh, you know, the, the idea of uh, this provocative idea of, an, you know, non, uh, the right to non-connectivity was to say, let's not make uh, the right to education dependent on technology and let's not lose sight of the fact that technology and connected technology is at the service of educational purposes, the why question. And, and, and the why is, and that's one of the lessons I think over the last year is that we have realized with the closure of schools that A, schools are more than, you know, provide more than education. Uh, we've seen that in, you know, nutrition and protection and health and, um, but also that education is more than curricula study and that if distance education, regardless of the, you know, technology or mix of technology used can deliver on curricula and maintain continuity of study, that education involves much more than that. Um, and it involves, um, and, and this, you know, key aspects of social, civic, uh, social, emotional, cultural learning happens in a social space and in social interaction. And that the um, that technology should be at the service of this and can be at the service also of uh, enhancing um, that type of learning. So I think that the, the why question is, uh, is key. And from that initial optimism, you know, of uh, finally from, you know, an ed tech discussion, which was at the periphery, if you want, you know, more progressive experimentation, innovation on one side, or ed tech, you know, technology being used to reach the unreached. It became central to all discussions initially with uh, uh, a great optimism, which has been tempered. And I think that the tempering goes with a, a shift in the focus to let's not lose sight of purpose. Let's not lose sight of the fact that uh, technology is at the service of, and this brings up, uh, you know, the key questions of, you know, our, our, our aims and, and goals um, in education in today's societies uh, in, in the context of the digital transformation of our societies, but also in the context of the, of the challenges uh, that face us and that define our moment, whether that has to do with climate change um, uh, or, uh, you know, some of the more fundamental questions the, that uh, technological developments beyond the digital, including in biotechnology and, and, and other spheres are, are you know, are, are are raising ar around what it means to be human and what is the role of education in reframing how we relate to others, how we relate to the living planet and, and how we relate to, to technology. Fundamental questions and, and hopefully the, the work of the, on the futures of education, um, the International Commission, I mean, that, that's what they're hoping to do with the report to be released in November is to prompt, it's not a blueprint of solutions of the way forward, but it's to invite and prompt um, a public debate and policy dialogue on, on these uh, fundamental questions. Thank you for that, Toby. Uh, yeah, it's great stuff. Um, are, you, are you happy with the progress of that? I'm, it's a bit early, isn't it? But uh, I'm hoping to have some really good information out in November, right? Uh, we'll, 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 <laughs> we're feeling <laughs> the pressure in our role in supporting the commission. Uh, but you may be aware that the, you know, the commission did put out, and you, you, know, you mentioned it at the beginning, that you, this was initiated pre-COVID, and then yeah. COVID broke out. The commission felt an obligation to say something, and they did put out something in, in um, a short you know, um, analysis, if you want, in, in, in June of last year, um, education in a post-COVID COVID world, and um, nine ideas for public action. Um, uh, so this was, you know, it 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 did modify um, it did modify the context within which the, the the work is happening. But I think, like like, you know, most would say, uh, uh, Chris about and, 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 and I mean, there is an opportunity. But you know, beyond the rhetoric of we, we, we you know we need to be pragmatic and realistic, but there is an opportunity uh, for uh, for transformation innovation and i would say not it, technology and the disruption and the closure of schools has prompted innovation not always reliance or dependent on technology either we've seen 
a lot of innovation in, in terms of pedagogy and curriculum and assessment. And we could imagine as we think about, you know, these why questions and the future and, um, you know, what, what kind of societies are we also preparing for in education? I mean, we could look at some, you know, some, some more uh, um, uh, perhaps radical uh, um, innovations. I'm thinking of, I mean, it's not entirely new, but, you know, we speak of digital skills. We speak of, you know, we need to be prepared to function in a digital economy, digital society we're dependent on. And yet in high stake examinations, in most cases, we forbid access to the internet. We prohibit access. In extreme cases, countries will shut down the internet to prevent cheating, you know, on examinations. <laughs> you know, there's a fundamental contradiction between our saying, you know, we need to be preparing for this world, uh, you know, and, 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 the, and, the, and the, the multiple facets of the digital transformation of our societies. And, and, the, and then in these key moments of validating and recognizing learning, we're not allowing the tool when it exists, I mean, that access. Um, and I think something like that, I mean, it's been tested a little bit in Denmark from years ago, and I'm, I'm, you know, not and a little bit in other Scandinavian countries, but I haven't seen too much follow up on that. But that would be a fundamental shift that would, you know, have a domino effect backwards on pedagogy, on curriculum, on, I mean, it, it, what you're preparing for is something entirely different. Do you know how to access information, to process it, uh, you know, to, 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 to check the quality, to combine and synthesize, to propose? I mean, it's a much more of a problem, you know, uh, um, based and, 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 and creative. I mean, it, 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 um, something like that would be an interesting, um, um, an interesting idea, for example, to, to, to take a little further. Absolutely. This is... Um... Um, let, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to hold that question for you for a minute, um, and 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 we'll get back to that because it was one of the things that I did want to try to cover. Um, so it's great that you bring it up, and in particular with that with that with that um, with that depth and and and, and visibility. Um, maybe I can sort of circle around before we go back to that that you just said. I can circle around to Cristobal because uh, you know we've thrown about his uh, comments all of us a little bit in the past few minutes and haven't really given him a chance to, <laughs> to continue to, to elaborate. Um, let me sort of go back to what you said, Cristobal, on that why and, and designing education for the future and all that sort of stuff that you presented. Um, how do we, you know, what are the lessons learned? Because we've seen, for example, and we commented before that a lot of the um, response to the pandemic has been, how do we get students online, right? That was the first sort of knee-jerk reaction from many governments and institutions and say we need to get people online because they're locked up at home and obviously this was a necessity and it was done in some cases in others it was it tried and whatever you know depending on budgets and availabilities and all that um, to the point where we know that even the the, the you know the the, the, the companies that, that actually build education equipment the ed tech sector was absolutely stressed out and had no stock for delivery of, of you know, computers or education devices during many months, right? So this obviously happened um, and, and it was necessary, but it, it was in some cases done you know, in a sort of a haphazard way. Um, and now we're finding that after that process is sort of not concluded, but has been going for a while, um, obviously we're coming to other problems such as you know, teacher training or capacities um, we're coming to problems such as we were just discussing before about how the families um, can can adapt to this new way of of of, of learning. Um, so how do we sort of avoid that this hamster wheel keeps on spinning, right? How do we get these people to sit down and say, you have to ask why, you have to design, you have to, you know, and then empower and and all that stuff. Do you have any sort of ideas about how we could try to push for that? And and I, I, also, I want to be fair. I don't think governments or ministries are, are averse to doing this. It's just that they don't really have the time or maybe even the knowledge and the capacity to, to do this in a sort of a, a structured way. Um, so anyways, if you have any thoughts in that area, it would be really interesting to hear. All right, thank you. Awesome, and I, and I love the idea of Xavier in terms of rethinking assessment. It's, it's yeah. one of the areas that is 
super hard to innovate. Um, everyone is delighted to innovate with AI in the delivery of contents, but when it's the moment of assessment, well, we get back to 200 years ago in terms of the control of the knowledge. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I think the way that countries have addressed the pandemic is such a good way of representing how learning is being understood for the last century uh, in, a, in terms of the, the, mer the emergency actions by many, many countries, most I would, I would dare to say, was focusing on delivering contents. So all the actions were on the supply of access to curriculum, learning materials, videos, uh, lectures, et cetera, et cetera. So all the discussion about the importance of skills was minimized because everything had to be focused on the idea of delivering contents. So the actions were multi-channel, high-tech, low-tech, highly digital, less digital, but delivering contents as much as possible. It's true that along the way, countries tend to prioritize some of the contents in the curriculum. And that also had to do with um, the, the, the decisions that drove countries to prioritize those contents in many cases were driven by the high-tech exams. Um, so on the one side, heavy emphasis on the delivery. It's true that some actions were taken to facilitate the exchange uh, between teacher and students. Uh, countries subsidizing connectivity, subsidizing video conferencing. I have in the top of my mind Uruguay and Argentina, in which the government commit to have free access to video conferencing or uh, zero rate in the case of Colombia, or Brazil, who, which decided to implement an app in which for an hour or two, teachers and students can interact according to some of the lessons from the, uh, that were streaming on television. But everything was delivery and some level of exchange. But I don't think there was a lot of room for innovation in that sense. And I think parents, they've been a new, the new kids on the block, they've been the new player, and in many cases, Parents have been the game changer. I remember Juan Pablo and I, we discussed that one year and a half ago, and I was very skeptical. And I, now I see the results, and I'm really surprised that when parents are engaged, it's a game changer because they, they create the context for learning. Um, now, innovations in most of the cases, no, no innovation, remote learning solutions in most of the cases have been highly centralized and led by the Ministry of Education. In only a few countries, you will find that the innovation is coming from the classrooms or from the schools. Uh, and, and, and the case that I have in the top of my mind is Estonia. Estonia is not being driven by the commands from the Ministry of Education. The schools have the freedom to prioritize and to have higher levels of, of autonomy. And this is essential because if you really wanna make transformations, you cannot dictate the, the innovation that everyone has to follow. Otherwise, it's, it's not innovation, it's just quality. And, and I think the, the, the big question we all have today is to what extent some of the things that we have ob observed in these different countries, which have been heavy focus on the deployment, will be time-proof, will be resilient to offer alternative ways of learning. So transitioning from remote learning to blended learning is much more an adaptation in terms of pedagogical solutions than the technological one. The question is, will we use those lessons learned during this process to offer a max, much more flexible way of learning, entitling higher levels of autonomy, higher levels of agency, and fostering curiosity? Because some people say that curriculum are answering questions the kids never ask. Uh, to what extent we can facilitate the idea that the kids will have a voice in terms of saying, this is what is inter interesting for me, and this will activate my, my future vocational interest. So in that sense, I'm not saying that everything has to be disrupted, but if we don't use this window called COVID, uh, we are going to really miss a strong opportunity. Now, truth to be told is before the pandemic, we saw that the large deployment of technology in most of the cases, we're not associated with better, better learning outcomes. Even in some cases, even negative learning outcomes. I do remember right before the pandemic in France, it was promoted the idea that mobile had to be banned in the schools and in the Spain, that was a decision that was at least in the press. So looking at that time now, it's like a completely bizarre context because technologies were not being the most beneficial component. So I think we have a lot, to, a lot of work to do to, um, to move technology out of the equation when we want to think in innovation, when we want to really reinvent the role of the teachers, giving the teachers more tools and resources, maybe having more than one teacher or having teachers who can play different roles and enabling the classroom to be much more alive. Uh, and that has to do with assessment, a much more flexible curriculum, 
opening room for exploration. Um, and that can be used with, that can be done with high tech and with low tech. We saw countries uh, which leverage on their lessons from Ebola and they are doing incredible things with radio. And I have to say that even in affluent countries, radio and television is heavily used, particularly in rural areas. So I, I think we have a bias toward highly digital, but in some cases that bias narrow down our, our, our the opportunities that we can see out of this, out of this uh, crisis. Excellent, thank you. That's very, very interesting to hear. Um, uh, yeah, and in particular, we do sometimes um, uh, run the risk of uh, thinking that, um, that one size fits all solutions sort of work and they don't, unfortunately. Um, it would be great if we could design something that would work for everyone exactly the same and would provide the perfect solution, but it doesn't. So uh, there needs to be that flexibility that you discussed, not only to the schools. And it brings to mind that uh, many, uh, many uh, countries and, 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 and education ministries actually have, you know, plans that their schools must adhere to and, and comply to and, and fill in and submit to be able to, uh, you know, to, to, be, to be functioning in valid schools. Um, um, but then you sort of scale up and say, well, what do the sort of ministries have to commit to and, 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 uh, and, and adhere to to be valid educational ministries, right? And, and again, I don't want to be too critical because it's a situation that's been very complex, but it certainly has not fomented um, the asking these questions that are so basic to uh, the evolution of, of the education system and what we really need. Um, in this time of change, um, and not only due to the pandemic, a time of social change that has been happening for many, many years already. Um, so it sort of, you know, raises that question of, do we need to have some sort of a, of a framework? Or do we need to have some sort of an incentive for ministries to actually uh, build towards this redesigning of their education systems um, and maybe support them in some way that, so that they're able to do this? Because um, you know, it's not easy. There's a there's a lot of political connotations associated to that, um, but also I think that um, there's a lot of um, unknowns uh, for some of these institutions to 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 um, to look up to and say, well, we you know we're going to risk um, making some innovations and some changes to the system that are actually meaningful and, and lead in this direction. And sometimes they're very much alone in trying to do this, uh, and it's very difficult. Um, so anyways, before we sort of move on, I don't know, Sobi or Juan Pablo, is there anything you would like to add to this conversation that we were having? Yeah, I, I would like to first thank Sobi and Crisol because that's been, their, their, um, their words have been intellectually very provocative. And I, I would like to, let me share a slide here. I think it's a, a fun slide um, to, to have here. Um, let me uh, let me see if I can find it here. Okay. I don't know if Cristobal and sorry have seen this before, um, but this is this is early twentieth century. A, a French newspaper commissioned illustrators to imagine different things in the future. So there was the future of agriculture. This is like the 19, 1909, 1910, future of agriculture, agriculture, future of cities. And this was the imagination of the future of the school in the year 2000. And I think it relates to what Sobi and Cristol were saying. Several things here that I think are important. This idea of education as, down, as just delivering content, which we also saw this year. Uh, what Cristal was saying, this idea of delivering content, but the, the idea of assessment is still not really there. Um, the idea of the role of the teacher as a passive agent that just puts an input in a machine, those books, and those books then, uh, the machine allows for the, for the children to absorb that knowledge via, via headphones, or, <laughs> or what it, it, it turned out to be headphones. Uh, the idea that the school, there's only boys, there's no girls. Uh, so the idea of gender. Uh, so I, I think when we discuss technology, of course, we have social values. But this is, when we talk about technology and disruption and what technology could do, it, it is not this. It, I don't think we, we want just 
a more efficient delivery of content vehicle. We want, and, and we don't want teachers or students to be just recipients, to be just users, to be just consumers. We want technology to be used as a tool to make things uh, and as a tool to create. Uh, and I think that transformation uh, that at the end of the day will happen in the classroom in a decentralized way is what we should aim for. Uh, and, and, and when we discuss technology in the vacuum, we sometimes make mistakes. I, I, I was, I, I, perhaps the, the, the first non-religious critique of technology came in the, in the third century before Christ. And it was uh, Socrates in, in Plato's Dialogue of Plato, uh, of, of Phaedro, when, when Socrates was criticized his writing as a technology that would make people dumber and as a technology that would uh, uh, sort of make people lazier and make people not able to recall and remember things. And, and you know, and, and in the vacuum, we might agree with him. Yeah, like there's nothing like conversation and it's true that written words are not the same as talking and perhaps talking is superior, but who would put in debate the importance of writing as, a, as an expression Val, the expression value of, of writing, the practical value of writing. I don't think we, we would criticize it now like Socrates did uh, uh, over two millennia ago. And I think something similar is happening with digital technology, with broadcasting technology. I think sometimes we criticize it in the vacuum from a position that allows us to criticize it because we have sometimes felt its negative impacts. But I think the potential would be the same as of writing. And, and the same as happens today when writing is not completely democratized because we still, we still have learning poverty, we, start, we still have foundational literacy gaps. I think the same will happen with digital technology. So just thinking, I think it's intellectually provocative to think of the right not to be connected. But for me, it would be the same as thinking the right not to write or, or learn how to, to read and write. Yeah, there might be a right uh, somewhere there, but I think, I think we want that, but we don't want that just for the thing itself. It's what you can do with digital technology or what you can do with writing. And I think the potential for learning new ways, creating new things is there. So just, just wanted to, to mention that because, because I, 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 think, uh, I, I think definitely being connected, having access to technology brings risks, but it also brings a lot of opportunity, not just, not just through digital technology, but to how we engage with, with each other, how we participate. So the potential is, is huge and, and, and we need to work to bring that opportunity, those risks and those opportunities to everyone on earth. Over, Albert. Thank you, Juan Pablo. Yeah, very provocative as well. Um, maybe, uh, Sobi, before we move on to the um, other to our next section. Um, um, I don't know if you wanted to comment a little bit more on this, and in particular, um, with regards to, uh, you know, to how we were discussing about um, the fact that uh, some of the uh, solutions or some of the responses that have been put in place um, are now sort of trying to keep up with themselves, right, in, in the sense that um, they're generating issues of their own. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks, Albert, and thanks, uh, Juan Pablo, on, on, on also those uh, uh, two interesting insights. And just on the last one, on the, the Socrates and the, um, I, th I think it's about a moment. I mean, we are, uh, as you're saying, you know, I mean, no one would, would today, um, uh, you know, question the right to literacy and then to writing. And um, in the same way that we would hope in, in, you know, the coming decades, we would we would be at that stage where we could consider, um, uh, you know, the right to the right to connectivity, uh, you know, as inherent to and a, and and a part of not only in support of but as as a part of the right to education. So I think the question is because we're not, um, um, you know, w because of where we're at and with the disparities that we know and. Um, that were exposed and reinforced um, 
and there is an opportunity, as we're saying, to, to do things differently that would uh, um, um, both help us, you know, bridge, uh, or help us uh, um, meet, you know, some of those uh, uh, commitments of the past, but also move us, uh, you know, in a different present and future. Uh, the importance, and maybe I could just say a quick word on that, uh, Albert, is, uh, on on the work around the declaration, it is to provide a little bit of a framework in saying, as we move in that direction, I mean, how do we chart that? And a lot of the discussion around connectivity in education has been very much around connectivity um, and less about education. I mean, connectivity for the purposes of education. But if we really think, how do we chart the way forward in terms of the digital transformation of education? Um, and and the you know the work that's um, underway now in, in in terms of trying to flesh that out to move beyond you know um, infrastructure issues the 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 uh, um, uh, the, the enabling uh, that uh, Cristobal was 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 mentioning um, and and to, and and to chart the way forward would be uh, you know the current thinking was around three principles one that we center the most marginalized so that it's not an afterthought that if we're really innovating uh with technology and connectivity and and in whatever context we are focused centering that on the most disadvantaged that can be then certainly be taken to scale uh rather than experimenting in more uh you know in more uh uh, uh you know in more adv uh, advantaged uh, uh context um uh, a, a second principle around which is often overlooked of um, expanding investment in free digital educational content so that we're really looking at public digital education platforms um, with the, you know, the necessary uh, diversity of content uh, that includes in different languages and different areas of learning that is uh, aligned with national and local, you know, educational uh, aspirations and, and curricula and standards. But the idea of, uh, and we've seen, I mean, as, as we know last year, I mean, in response to the closure, I mean, it was, yeah, in, in every context, I mean, there was an attempt to do what was possible with whatever means were available. But if we're really moving in this direction, then we, meet, we need solid public, uh, digital education platforms, easy access, uh, uh, easily, um, you know, accessible and appropriate content, um, uh, and, and which is, uh, which is uh, free. And third, to say that the digital transformation of education or connectivity in education must be related to pedagogical transformation. Um, and it's, um, and, and it's, it's about avoiding, you know, just uh, uh, replicating kind of traditional schooling pedagogical models online or in the digital space. I mean, some think, well, digitizing curricular material, putting it online, that's digi digital transformation of education. Um, and then obviously issues which, uh, I mean, around, you know, safe, uh, safe use um, of, of uh, you know, of, of, of these tools, which are part of our lives. Um, but also, as we said earlier, I mean, how technology can um, fulfill the multiple purposes that we assign to education, the multiple whys of education, including how technology could strengthen, you know, social and civic dimensions of learning. Um, uh, uh, and, and as was said before, I mean, our focus, I mean, worldwide on delivery, on maintaining that link to, you know, just curricula study um, over the past year and more, uh, has you know has 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 caused us in many cases to sideline some of those more important aspects. So I think you know what you're saying is absolutely right. It's evolution of you know of 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 humanity over time and 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 technology. And I think it is uh, it, that's where it is interesting to put things in perspective, both you know um, uh, retrospectively, historically, but also to project and to say there's a lot of discussion about. Uh, you know, leapfrogging, um, and leapfrogging as in we can we we can jump several steps, um, and you know there's almost a shortcut. 
Perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think we need to be a little bit cautious with that. There's certainly an opportunity for transformation of education. And a lot of that transformation, uh, as we said, not necessarily dependent on technology, but in terms of moving towards what is an inevitable digital transformation of our societies and of education, that that we 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 um, that we move forward with with some shared understandings of uh, um, uh, some framing uh, that that helps us move uh, you know in that direction without uh, you know penalizing uh, you know th those who are in less disadvantaged situations or that we are weakening I mean in you know in um, a public education system. So, I mean, how do we move in a way to this digital transformation of education that is ensuring, you know, solid, sustainable uh, um, uh, uh, transformation? So, this was, I mean, I'm just saying on this work on the declaration is a piece to um, help in that direction for precisely, I think, what you were saying on the last point is. We're inevitably moving there. It will not happen overnight, um, you know, across the world in the same way that over decades we have not been able to ensure, you know, the right to basic education for all. We have made progress, uh, but we see, you know, the remaining challenges. How, how do we move in this direction, but in a way that, um, you know, that ensures that we not lose sight of our, uh, of our, um, you know, of our uh, bigger goals, basically, uh, you know, and our, our ultimate aims in terms of education and, and development. I'm sorry, I went on too long on that one. I'll no, not at all. Thank you, Sylvie, for that. That was very interesting um, and, and very much in line, actually, with, I think, where I would like to sort of take us now in, in a couple, in a minute. Um, but, but just before that, I do want to remember the audience um, that we have, that they can ask questions, and, and we are in a conversation, mm -hmm. but we are also ready to answer any questions that might come up from the audience. So you just click on the sort of the little chat button you have down um, at your right, I believe, and you can just type in any questions there and, and we'll try to get to, the, to those as well. I think we already have a few lined up, but, um, but we'll, we'll, you know, happy to get more and, um, and, and make them also hard questions, please. We want to answer hard questions. Um, so um, I'm, and I'm gonna start maybe sort of taking up on, 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 on what you were co commenting. Uh, so we've, you know, beyond the declaration for connectivity for education, um, you know, we are facing um, many different issues in, in how we address education, um, you know, at a systemic level in, uh, across the globe. Um, so I'm gonna sort of be a little bit harsh here and say, you know, uh, to all of you, not, not to anyone in particular, but to anyone who wants to sort of take up this question. And again, there's not gonna be a yes or no answer to this, obviously, um, but you know, how, how Far or how much do we need to do to our current education systems um, to actually get to where we want to go? And do we need to break them, or, or are they, you know, are, are they? Can we really adapt them to where we think we have to go, or have we sort of reached the end of, uh, you know, of, of of the leeway that we can have with the current systems and need to need to change to new ones? And again, assessment is one part of this, um, but there are many others as well, right? It may be the way we deliver, the way we. Uh, engage society with education, the way we, um, you know, the way we assess, uh, the way we think about what that education has to provide for our students and for our learners, you know, does it have to be, uh, you know, pages of knowledge stored in their, in their minds that they can, you know, that, that obviously have a benefit and have a value, but, you know, what else do they need to have? Those skills that we talk about, those things, can we do that with the current systems we have? Um, how far are we from that? And, and you know, and, and, and again, I think there's also some work that you guys are doing, again, back to you, Sobi, but also um, I'm sure at UNICEF and, and at the World Bank um, um, on, on having this sort of dialogue about education in the future, right? And, you know, we talk about 2030, but then there's also this 2050 sort of window that we're looking at to say, what do we need to change? So I guess sort of to put that question into a more short version of what I've been saying for the past, I guess, minute and a half now already, <laughs> is you know, how do we need to change education? What are the things we need to do? And are the systems that we have useful for, for that? Or do we need to, to really just rip them up and, and bring in new ones? Who wants to go ahead? It's not an easy question, I know. And it doesn't have a single, simple answer, obviously. <laughs> Cristola, me, I, yeah, you're, you're Let me up. start and my colleagues will make it much more compelling than myself. I, 
and within this discussion, I've been thinking in this old saying from John Daniels, former rector of the Open University in the UK, who used to write this article on, um, which was entitled, if technology is the answer, what was the question? Um, and we can, we can replace the word technology for connectivity. If connectivity is the answer, what is the question? And I think this is so essential. This is bringing us back to the idea of the why that my colleagues have been sharing. Um, and today there is a declaration of connectivity that I have to say, I think is remarkable, is essential because we have half of the planet living in the digital darkness. Uh, but I was wondering while I was listening, whether in a couple of years we will be writing a manifesto on the access to AI for all. Um, and, and, and perhaps I think the challenge is how can we keep the eye and the energy on all these transformations without losing sight of what is the most essential component. Um, uh, for years, all the multilateral organizations have been pushing an idea of increasing coverage, having access, as universal access to education, reducing to zero the illiteracy. And along the last decades, that conversation also has been evolving the idea of increasing quality and increasing relevance. And I think here we have so much work to do because that education, is, um, is in this permanent dance between tradition and disruption, between bringing the values and the history and the know-how that we know from the past and our parents want that we learn the same thing that they learned. And at the same time, um, employers, artists, intellectuals, they want us to prepare for a future that is nowhere near to the current present. So this tension is essential in the nature of education. And I think this is the beauty of it. But at the same time, that requires some level of flexibility. And the question is to what extent we can use this pandemic to learn if these systems are flexible enough to change. Uh, a system can be flexible to transition from television to YouTube. That's cool. Awesome, welcome. The question is whether that will entail the most uh, essential transformations that I think will go far beyond that, um, where people will have to deal with some machines that won't replace probably activities, but might replace some tasks uh, in environments where the, the problem is not having access to information, but is having access to so much information that you have to invest energy and a lot of critical thinking to discriminate what is rubbish from what is relevant. Um, we have to transition also in this idea of listing, uh, because this, this is what we do in many cases, listing the 21st century uh, skills that we all learn by heart and we can list them very easily, collaboration, creative thinking, communication, blah, blah, blah. But the gap between listing those skills to implementing them and facilitating the development of that is so huge that we really struggle to make these actions scalable in a sense that systems are transitioning from um, an industry design into something that will help people to navigate in environments where, for instance, it's most likely that the remote work will be much more uh, normal than what it has been for the last decades. And that says so much in terms of how we build relationships. How can we be compelling? How can we work with people that we don't know? How can we build trust with people that we don't know, that we, we haven't had a coffee together? And, and the question is whether we can bring those changes within the systems, outside of the system, or in a blended model, which could be in the borders of the system. I like when you say the end of the current system, because you, you make me think in Fukuyama, the end of the history. Is this the end of the history of education, or is just another, another uh, hurdle to jump? And I think um, that probably there's not a magic answer, and my colleagues will reply, but I think the systems are resilient enough to have the opportunity to dance in different speed. Some people will be have the opportunity to have so innovative practices that they will have curiosity and agency and the opportunity of addressing challenging and wicked problems, while at the same time, others within the same system will be encouraged to repeat and memorize things. Um, and I think the, the more um, open will be the walls between these different approaches, because sometimes we will need classic lectures. That's not again the lectures. It's the idea of the idea of restricting opportunities of transformation. I think this is a ch the challenge we have, and also the idea of having innovations that can be scalable. Because we see a lot in Barcelona, for instance, I, which is in a context that I know very well, there are amazing cases of innovative schools 
And the question I have is, can we do that in a way that is replicable to all the schools in Europe, for instance? I think this is, in terms of scalability, there's also an equity question. But I'll get back to my colleagues, which probably have much more compelling arguments to provide. Thank you, Cristal. And I, I think some of your arguments are fantastic. Um, I, Juan Pablo, you were saying you wanted to... to yeah, sure. Go, go yeah, I, I feel we, we have been very organized in going in circles, in, in the, not in the conversation, but in the, in the turn order. So happy to, to, to say something about this. I, look, I don't know if it's the end of, uh, of education systems. I don't think so. But I, I think if we surveyed ministers of education worldwide and we ask them what type of a school did their children or are their children attending i my suspicion is that it's going to be a large minority the ones who have their children in public schools uh, and and that is a that is a thermometer of trust in the public school system it's not the whole education system but it's a thermometer of the trust and the level of competence that ministers of education would have in their system or the system they largely lead. So I think that's just one picture. Another photograph, like the picture we saw of the school in the future, that's another picture. So there's something that is not working and has not been working. And if you ask past ministers of education worldwide, I think that's gonna be most of the, the large majority of children of ministers of education and of presidents would not be attending public schools. So that's one thing. It's not gonna be the end because I think we have invested globally a lot in having the systems we have. Uh, investment in human resources, investment in infrastructure, investment in political debate. There's engagement. And I think COVID-19 brought a heightened look at education together with health and economic recovery as part of like the, the, the triad of big topics for most societies. Uh, so I think we have invested too much. Uh, and, and I think uh, uh, in some cases, there's gonna be systems that are gonna leapfrog, uh, but leapfrog, and I, and I, and I empathize with Sobi here, I, I think you leapfrog perhaps in a decade or two, that we're gonna be a leapfrogging, it's perhaps not going to be a shorter time frame. Some of them will defrog, some of them would incrementally improve, some of them will remain the same. What I think is gonna be sort of a, a consequence of the slow pace uh, of, of, of improvement in some cases is that you're gonna have an increase uh, uh, sort of answers at the borders of the system and new things at the borders of the system. Sometimes the border of the system might be a school that is highly performing in an area or a geographic area or with social demographics where other schools are not higher performing. And, and you're gonna have those positive deviants. Uh, you're going to have teachers that are extraordinary and are gonna change the lives of children no matter which school they are. Uh, and you're gonna have parents that after COVID-19 are gonna be increasingly concerned about the education their children have been receiving and will be receiving, and I'm gonna invest on alternative models. And they have always been investing in those. If you look at, if you look at social, socioeconomic status and all the studies, we know that parents of privileged children do not stop at just paying for the best school they can pay for. There's also extracurriculars, sports, clubs, and I think you're gonna have a version of that across many segments of society within their resources and, 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 uh, and opportunities. And I think you're gonna have uh, families, uh, because families cannot wait. I'm, I'm the father of a four and a two year old. I cannot wait for 20 years for the school systems to improve. So everyone is gonna, in the life cycle of their children, they're gonna try to find the best solutions they can to improve the opportunities of their children. Uh, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be messy, chaotic, also exciting. Uh, and I think, uh, and I think the, the reform, the seats of reform, as they have always been, are gonna be there. And we'll see, we'll see one, two, or three, or perhaps five education systems that are gonna leapfrog like South Korea did, 
like Hong Kong did, like New Zealand did. So I, I think we'll, we'll see some of those. Yeah, thank you for that, Juan Pablo. Very interesting. And um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, as we said, there's no yes or no answers to any of these questions, but it's very interesting to hear this debate because I think it also brings to light questions that many teachers and educators have you know, around how the system supports them. And it also brings to light, there's a question I have here from the audience that I think is quite interesting. I'm seeing a few, I'm trying to, uh, we won't be able to get to all of them, but I'm trying to find ones that sort of are interesting that we can that we can uh, face now. Um, and, and this one I, I, I found interesting because um, it, unfortunately, I don't know who makes the question, but um, the question is basically, have we asked teachers whether they want to be connected? Um, so, you know, it, it sort of circles a little back towards what you were saying at the beginning, Cristobal, about um, you know the environment, and I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but I think it was uh, the the conditions, you know, enabling conditions, I believe it was, and, and the supportive environment. Um, so you know, how do we see this? Because obviously we we've had to shift to connectivity, um, you know, almost uh, obligatory connectivity. Let's put it that way, for for obvious reasons. Um, we are now working on trying to get this you know this declaration of, of connectivity as a right. But obviously, there's many, many teachers who not only feel that they don't want it, um, but also that they don't really know how to use it, um, and they don't know how to fit into this new environment. Um, so, you know, what would you, I mean, do you guys have any considerations on that front? I mean, I, I know, again, it's not really a question, but, you know, how do we, how do we bring teachers into the fold? How do we give them that supportive environment and, and that, that help that they need? would like to, to take this up. This is not an easy one again. Maybe maybe I can sort of ping you, Cristobal. Okay. Because... Oh, okay, go, go ahead. You ping Cristobal or I can... No, go ahead, Juan Pablo. No problem. No, I, I, just a few, uh, um, just quickly. I, I think like many of us uh, who are, I don't like the, the phrase, but digital natives, we... Uh, uh, we we learned technology when we were uh, in my case when I was a teenager. I remember the excitement to to know that there was something called Hotmail and that you can open an account and it was free and I couldn't believe it was free. Um, uh, there is something education systems can do to uh, engage with teachers that is not related to pedagogical instruction, directions, uh, modeling. And it's just increased familiarity with technology uh, in the education system as a management tool. So using emails, using uh, uh, text messages, uh, using sort of in the, on the administrative side of being a teacher, using technology and just engaging uh, in, uh, in, in, in with that as much as possible. Why? Because there's a disconnect if we're saying the classroom, needs to be you have to have blended learning and you have to know how to use all the technologies but when the the, the hour of the class is over then go back to your papers and just like fill forms that then someone inputs uh, in the school into an excel sheet that gets sent somewhere so there there is something in the, on the management side that you can do with teachers another one which i think is just putting demystifying blended learning and put it in a, 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 on the same subset of pedagogical approaches that we have been talking for decades, project-based learning, a, a personal inquiry, a, a, a sort of the use of homework strategically. A, a, and, and, and then you can add technology more naturally and seamless than just trying to, again, let's start the class, Let's turn on our devices, and, and I have to be a teacher, and I also have to be a repair person, a technical support, because there's three devices that are not turning on, and everyone is losing time because, because we need support. So we need a balance that works practically. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think you can, you, can, uh, you can ask, I don't think you can ask for teachers if they want to be connected or not, because society is connected. But I think you can ask for a more, an easier way 
to, uh, to connect and use that connectivity and that technology for pedagogical purposes. Thank you, Juan Pablo. I have another question, actually. I don't know, did you want to follow up, Cristobal, or are you okay if I go to another question? Please go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, just chip in any anytime you guys want. Don't 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 wait for me. Um, but I'll, I will ask another question because I thought also was interesting. It's actually from a from a Catalan school, um, and a lady by the name of Susana Martinez who's asking from Instituto Al Tres Turons. She's basically asking us if we are observing not only uh, here but in other places um, that although many of the uh, students that are are being connected. Um, are actually using digital technologies. They, in fact, have very little knowledge about um, what it really means to use these digital technologies and what the impact is to their privacy and to a number of other things. Um, you know, I, I think we can probably safely say that, yes, that is an issue, but I don't know if you may want to comment on it in particular, Cristóbal, because you you have actually written a book about this in a way, so it might be interesting to hear, to hear your thoughts. Uh, happy to. Uh, we have pending uh, to listen. Sorry that I'm sure that has a lot of things to add here. Um, you know, when when you are in emergency mode and your boat is sinking, you have to rush and grab something that allows you to be floating. And you should understand that the uh, and you address the fact that you will get wet. For instance, to say something silly, you know. And and I think in this emergency mode, the priorities are being to be connected uh, at whatever cost. And I think um, the transactional cost of being connected sometimes is not well addressed in terms of privacy, in terms of how the, the data, these huge volumes of data that the systems are transactioning, in some cases internally in their systems, but in many cases externally to private providers whose use of the data is a, bit, a little bit of a black box. Uh, this is a kind of pending conversation, but has been always a pending conversation because when we had this conversation, Albert, in 2019, there also were so many much more important things to tackle back then. So privacy, we will talk about privacy later on. So let, let give me a minute and I'll get back to you on that. So I think this is um, a pending conversation, it's a pending innovation. And, and instead of blaming anyone in particular, instead of thinking that uh, every country has to follow the GDPR, uh, framework from the EU, I think we have to bring that as an, an additional capacity to work in data intensive environments. The idea of understanding uh, what an algorithm is and how our life has been, can be heavily influenced by um, algorithms that are shaped by bias is something that teachers need to use. And the, the heavy use of uh, technology also leaves a huge digital footprint online. And if we know how to use this data on the benefit of the education, we can do so much good but also understanding some of the trade backs. So, so there's not a quick solution. And I think understanding digital citizenship, footprint, manipulation, um, the, the bias of the algorithms has to be part of the digital skills that we have to develop. And the managers of education, they need to talk this language. This is a language that seems to be a foreign thing for geeks and for lawyers. And no, I think the more enthusiasm we allocate to the digital tools, the more relevant this conversation has to happen. And I think um, there's plenty of resources online, but I think we need a voice from the community to say, we have to do this and this connect me with the previous question, with the teachers, not to the teachers. We have to bring the innovation with the community and not impose a new course on privacy because we are not gonna do any change on that. Back to you. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's exactly true. And we've seen this in fact, uh, in different scenarios, right? And I think we already commented this uh, earlier, but um, it, you know, it, it's very much true that we need to be in sync with what the system can provide and how it functions and, and make sure that we listen to the different parts of it and, and the teachers very much in particular to make sure that we are uh, doing things that, that, that make sense for them and, and for the way they can, uh, they can deliver education. So, uh, Sobi, I just wanted to, to touch on you again because um, we sort of came back to this also, but um, it's again this vision of where education or where, where we're going um, in terms of, of the future and sort of to, you know, to sort of wrap it up now, we have a couple of three minutes left, um, but I just wanted to see if how you, you know, what your opinion is and if you're happy with, you know, how we are working as a community, the different institutions, the different, you know, the, the private sector, the public sector, are we facing things in the right way or what should we be, we be doing to actually move towards this, this, joint, this joint vision of an education system for the future? 
again, no easy questions here. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, and and and, uh, and I'm in no position to be advising <laughs> on what what needs to be done. But let me just uh, say something to come back to the uh, the report of the International uh, Commission on the Futures of Education, which is a call for uh, public debate. And I mean, this would relate also to obviously teachers, young people, whether they are students through student organizations or, or others. But um, it, the report is provisionally titled Learning to Become Together. Uh, the learning to become is the why question. I mean, what do we collectively want, want to become? How, you know, looking at current trends, we look to the future. What, what is the future that we want? collectively, um, and, and how do we build this uh, together? Um, in a sense, and to echo perhaps some of, you know, what the, the UN Secretary General is also considering now and in preparation for uh, a report to be released um, uh, in, in September around our, our common agenda, which does look beyond 2030. It's, it's very much focused initially on, you know, thinking multilateralism and the, the role of the UN. And it was part of the 75th anniversary sort of dynamic. So it's, it's looking at 2045. I mean, not as a, you know, particular set date, but just to say, okay, we, we do have the 2030 agenda, but, but let's kind of look beyond. And if we're thinking about long-term, you know, governing for the future and long-term governance, um, to come back to the education, not the end of the, you know, education or the schooling model, but I would say perhaps, you know, the end of a historical cycle in terms of how we're thinking. I mean, it's not, uh, uh, you know, let's, let, you know, that's it. We're, you know, we're, school is over and, you know, we're, we're finally moving away from that. There are things to preserve, like any cycle there are good things. I mean, the, our whole education systems are the result of collective effort over decades and in some cases centuries. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a great human achievement to have, uh, you know, even created, you know, the, 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 the idea of, of, of public education and as a right. And some things are to be preserved and some are to be transformed. Uh, so we could say it's, it's, it's about redefining a social contract for education and then what what would some of those implications be but have it, it it's a discussion to be had and i think that's what the contribution of the report of the commission will be it's to say here's an invitation to start that conversation and that conversation has to has to happen at all levels be contextualized in in you know in the diversity of context and should include everyone. Um, that is the idea of the of, of the uh, together. And and I think there are. Uh, I mean, to, just to tie back to what we said at the beginning, which is nothing new. I mean, everyone um, you know frames this. I mean, we do have a unique opportunity now. Again, this thinking was you know started or was initiated before COVID, but COVID is certainly a um, uh, an opportunity. And uh, and. You know, we, we could think at different levels, but I mean, in, um, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, I mean, a, a simple rediscovery is a little bit the flipped classroom. I mean, just with the disruption of schooling, which means, and, and, and to come back to the balancing, I think it's an issue of rebalancing. I mean, Christopher, Christop, you, you were using the, the, this issue of balancing or rebalancing. I think it's a question of rebalancing. It's not about, you know, um, uh, radical disruptive change um, uh, and and agree with uh, one part of that you know in some cases we can you know we, we can accelerate um, uh, you know progress other places be more incremental but it's about balancing and if you know one th from a pedagogical point of view that acquiring you know accessing information acquiring kind of no understand you know no no uh, new knowledge can largely be done alone we have realized over the past year, I mean, the importance of, so what can we do together? I mean, that precious time together for the application development of competencies uh, to have an ethical framing around that. I mean, what is the ultimate purpose of, you know, whether it's problem-based and project-based and uh, if we speak, so the school 
I think somewhere, I mean, something to be preserved, it remains a central pillar of a broader educational uh, uh, ecosystem, but some things will have to change. I, I say educational ecosystem. I mean, we often use learning ecosystems. Uh, learning, we can lose sight of the collective, the collective purpose, the collective functions. I mean, education is about learning that is intentional and purposeful. And to some extent needs to be, you know, needs to be organized to different degrees of inst institutionalization. So if we are really talking about broader ecosystems in which the school uh, preserved yet transformed uh, remains a central pillar. But if we are talking about these uh, public educational um, ecosystems, that will also require, you know, uh, uh, different modes of governance. I, I take one example just on that. I won't cite the country, but where the education sector is actually monitored, I mean, the, the planning uh, of the sector and, and the, reg, you know, the annual evaluation is, is done by a team within the Ministry of Social Development. I, I can't remember the exact. Uh, they bring together the multiple uh, government departments involved in education in some way, whether the educational departments or youth and women and, you know, and, and labor and others. And now we would include also technology and, and, and that whole. Um, and I, I just thought this, that's the way we should be conceived. We're still very locked in kind of education sector. And, and education sector, we're often actually talking about the school system within that education sector. But if we really are talking, um, you know, um, education ecosystems, um, we will need to reimagine, you know, even at that level, I mean, this is going to the other extreme of, you know, from the innovation that can happen on, you know, uh, at the level of teachers and school leaders and particular schools or networks of schools, the, 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 a completely different approach, I think, to how we understand what is a national education system, uh, ecosystem, um, and, and how, you know, how should that be uh, coordinated and, uh, uh, and managed, and that the school remains central to that, the school with a lot of its um, positive, you know, should be maintained. But it, but requiring transformation uh, uh, definitely, um, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of pedagogy and 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 the opportunity to develop and apply uh, the competencies we need today and to contribute. I think that the, the idea of the knowledge commons, I mean, and connecting to curriculum, it is both how do we uh, how do we nourish ourselves through the accumulated you know, knowledge, which is our common heritage, but how do we also prepare something critical with that? And in our accumulated heritage is also bias, is also mechanisms of you know, uh, exclusion. How do we critically, so it's also the, you know, this learning to unlearn and, and to contribute. How does one then co-create and contribute to this evolving uh, knowledge commons? So I think there, there are implications that, but I, I think we could say we're at the end of a historical cycle, maybe not the model of the school, you know, uh, ending, but that we, we need that dialogue and debate on, uh, you know, what we, what we could call the social contract around education. Um, yeah, agreed. Over to you. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So that, I think that was actually a great wrap up. Um, and, and we are a little bit over time. Um, so I'm going to let all of you guys go and the audience as well. I just want to take the opportunity quickly to thank you all for the contributions today. It was, I think, a very, very interesting debate. I certainly had a lot of fun. I hope you guys did too. Um, I hope the audience enjoyed it as well. Um, and what we will do is we will be certainly taking some of these things you've mentioned and some of these, and a little bit of the wrap up you did as well, Sobi and probably asking you guys to develop a little bit on that in the future and maybe ask you some more questions and, and, and uh, throwing that into the mix um, for future sessions. So with that, thank you very much, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed and I hope to see you guys soon in our next sessions of, uh, of EdChange. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.